Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Alright, so now that we have spatial dependence in data, the distribution of z will look slightly different and we have seen that it will be different in the variance covariance matrix representation. So now my sequence z which is the sequence of data points which are n data points uh, 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 that I have, I am going to now define it with a uh, you know uh, a location vector s. So instead of sort of you know uh, working with the sequence z1 to zn, I am now sort of picking bringing in these location indices s1, s2 till sn just to sort of you know notationally represent the data being a spatial data set, right. So mathematical notation is just helping me give this extra rich dimension to my sequence, right. I can say z1 or zs1, it will not really matter but S1 is location, it is a deterministic location and Z is the value realized which is a random draw from a distribution, right. So it is a rich English interpretation of this mathematical device ZSI. This is going to be distributed again as a multivariate normal, uh, normal with mean mu, so we have the same mean as the spatially independent case, uh, but the variance covariance matrix now is given as sigma with a functional dependence on theta. Obviously sigma is a uh, n by n matrix. Now this sigma theta provides me a measure of covariance uh, of values at, uh, at location zsi and location sj. Right? So it provides me a general covariance structure between the data and this structure you know is, 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 is driven by their locational differences Si and Sj. If I were to think about the matrix formulation, well it is an n by n matrix. So it is really a collection of all uh, you know covariance Zi, Zj is just a, an element where i and j we know go from 1 to n, right. So we are basically looking at different combinations of i and j, uh, you know, in this covariance element, right. So when s i and s j, they are representing the same location, that is i is exactly equal to j, I have the diagonal element. So I have variance of z1, variance of z2, all the way till variance of Zn, right. The off diagonal elements are interesting. Now I have covariance Z1 and Z2, covariance Z2 and Z3, sorry Z1 and Z3 all the way till covariance Z1 and Zn, right. Similarly, the off diagonal values will be non-zero and will be driven by spatial dependence in data, right. And this spatial dependence is coming from you know the fact that this covariance, this covariance will depend on this parameter theta through the parametric variogram model variogram model uh, uh, representation such that uh, 2 gamma such that 2 gamma h is equal to 2 gamma h theta, right. And, and we know that theta is in a, is itself in a parametric space uh, capital theta. Now this 2 gamma h and 2 gamma h theta will provide me a representation for the covariance structure 
through the fact that 2 gamma h theta will be equal to 2 c 0 minus 2 c h right. This is a relationship a theoretical relationship that we have studied earlier right. So, so that means that the fact that I have a parametric variogram model is the fact that I can then formulate the covariance uh, uh, you know structure in the sigma theta matrix and if I am able to then estimate theta I can you know get to the variogram estimate as well because so long as I have theta hat ml I have my variogram 2 gamma hat which depends on the theta hat ml right. So, what will really change in my analysis? What really will change is that I will now have we will now have the following the following log likelihood function right. Because my variance covariance matrix has changed from sigma squared i n to this uh, you know sigma theta representation it will provide me a different log likelihood function. So, I have l n l sorry l n l which depends on mu and theta, theta can itself be a ve ve parameter right oh sorry it can itself be a, a, a vector of multiple parameters right and this is going to be minus n by 2 log of 2 pi minus 1 by 2 log of uh, you know uh, sigma theta. So, the determinant uh, of this matrix minus half uh, z s minus mu right transpose times sigma theta inverse. So, I am taking an inverse of this n by n matrix and I have uh, z s minus mu. So, this is a little bit complicated well you know I have a scalar entity on the left hand side. So, on the left hand side I have a scalar entity. The first entity is scalar the second entity is scalar, I am working with a determinant value, but the last entity is more complicated, it seems it is composed of vectors and mat matrices. So, let us look at it more carefully. So, this z I know is a n by 1 vector, mu itself is a n by 1 vector. So, this whole entity being transposed which is n by 1 minus n by 1 is going to be n by 1 transpose of n by 1 is going to be 1 by n. Sigma theta is n by n right, it is inverse, inverse of an n by n matrix is also n by n. So, I am going to have n by n the middle part of this sandwich and the last part is going to be n by 1 minus n by 1 the whole thing will be n by 1 ok. Now, when we start to multiply these matrices, we can look at the first two just to simplify our lives. The first two are 1 by n multiplied by n by n. So, first thing to realize is they are conformable. We can multiply them because the number of columns in z s minus mu is the same as the number of rows in sigma theta inverse right. So, that is how we figure out whether or not the matrices are conformable that is is their product really defined. Here it is indeed defined and this product will turn out to be a 1 by n that is uh, going to be a combination of this one here and this n here. So, once I have this 1 by n matrix I can go ahead and multiply it with this n by 1 matrix. Again these are conformable because the number of uh, you know uh, uh, columns in the left hand side matrix is uh, is the same as the number of rows in the right hand side matrix, but the size of this matrix is going to be interestingly 1 by 1 which is nothing but a scalar. So, I really have a scalar entity on the right hand side even though it might look a little bit more complicated than what we have seen till now 
right. So, the fact is that I am trying to maximize, I am trying to maximize my objective again objective is to maximize because I am working in maximum likelihood. So, I am going to maximize log l n l mu theta, let us just write it down quickly so that you know we have a consistent uh, you know uh, notes for you. Okay. So, we have a scalar entity on the right hand side, we want to maximize this log likelihood by choosing mu and theta. Okay. So, our choice variables are mu and theta and theta, theta itself is composed of components like nugget and b, c0 and b for linear model, for linear variogram model. right. In case of spherical model, we had the nugget, the sill and the range. So, the number of choice variables will depend on which variogram model do you want to work with as an analyst, right. Whether you want to go with the linear or the spherical is your choice. So, I am going to say this is the analyst's choice. Okay, whichever way you go, you can write down the first order conditions, solve them and you will have, I am going to say this exercise will yield theta hat ml, right. That is in case of a linear variogram model, we will have c0 hat ml and we will have b hat ml, right. Once you have that, you will also have a data driven variogram. 2 gamma hat h comma theta hat ml, which is nothing but c0 hat ml, which is now a value data driven understanding of spatial dependence, which is exactly ml, b hat ml and h. So, this is the data driven representation of what is the nugget in my given sample and b hat is the rate of decline in spatial dependence as we move away from any given location by a lag vector h. Right? So, we have a data driven entity of b hat and c0 hat ml. You should not be, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, you should not uh, feel, uh, you know, uh, terrified by these things. One of the very, uh, the reason is that although these algorithms, you know, when we work with them, they look mathematically intensive and, you know, sort of tedious, most of these are going to be canned. So, towards the end of this course, we will study uh, you know, uh, uh, we will do hands on tutorials on, on R, which, which will provide us, you know, uh, 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 you know, software, uh, you know, syntax, which will directly spit out the theta hat ml and, uh, you know, the variogram estimator given the data set you have. But it is very important to know when you work on these software, typically what happens is you run, you write a code, you run a syntax and a black box works, you know, uh, which basically is maximizing all of these things and it is, uh, you know, eventually giving you, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, the final answer. You know, we may use, we will always use the final answer, but we should know what is happening in that black box because when you work with real world data sets, when you work with complex problems, when you do research, you know, you can't really rely on what the software is giving you. If you don't understand what is happening behind the scenes, uh, in all likelihood you are going to get stuck at some point or your or explanation of the physical world will come out to be nonsensical sometimes and so on and so forth, right. If you understand the machinery, well great, use the software, right. Use the convenience of computation to do, to, to actually uh, calculate these things. But that does not discount the value of learning the process at as it goes on, uh, you know, mathematically. Okay. Now, there is a very important note that I want to give you before I end this maximum likelihood estimation is that ML estimates 
theta hat m l are biased right why they are biased because they do not account for these do not account for the degrees of freedom. Okay. These do not account for the degrees of freedom and, 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 and what does it mean for us to say that it do not account for degrees of freedom for which for this we will refer to the IID case where we had sigma hat squared m l equals summation i equals 1 to n z i minus z bar the whole square divided by n. Now, earlier in this course when I wrote you know uh, 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 sigma hat squared I said it is rather n minus 1 and this n minus 1 accounts for a loss of degrees of, of, of 1 degree of freedom because of the fact that in this definition I have already used z bar. That means, although I am using z 1 to z n by using also the knowledge of z bar, I could have used any one of you know one less of this sequence of z 1 to z n. Let us say I did not know z n, I only knew z 1, z 2 all the way till z n minus 1 and I also know z bar, I can back out z n. That means, in the definition of sigma hat squared m l, I am using the net variation of n minus 1 values given the knowledge of z bar and hence in the denominator, I should have had a n minus 1 and not n. But when you solve those first order conditions in the, in the IID case, we can look at them now, when we solve these you know two first order conditions the sigma hat squared m l that comes out does not you know account for one the loss of degree of freedom right. So, this loss of you know degree of freedom loss remains unaccounted. This is very very important it is it is really a fundamental knowledge uh, that m l estimates are fundamentally biased for the variance covariance estimators. And the bias becomes larger and larger the smaller the data set that you are working with. Okay, so, the next uh, you know algorithm for achieving a fit of the variogram is called as the least squares algorithm or the least squares estimator for a variogram model. Okay. Uh, now, as you move forward, remember we started with experimental variograms, right? What were experimental variograms? Well, it is just 2 gamma h of j. So, the h j means is h 1, h 2, h 3, h 4, so different lag values in a given direction E, right? So, h j is nothing but the lag vectors the lag vectors uh, in a given direction E, right. That is I have H 1, H 2, H 3 and keep going till H n or let us say H, let us not use n because n is the sample size let us say H k ok ok. So, I have I have for the experimental variogram I have manually gone in chosen k different lag values formed a vector of these lag values and evaluated the variogram cloud for each of the h j lag values in a given direction let us say east west direction and then uh, you know uh, 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 you know did this for all different lag values. So, k is the number of lags. Okay. Now, the variogram model on the other hand will be given as 2 gamma h j e, but with a parameter vector theta. 
Now, theta we know is C 0 and B for a linear model right and theta you know could be uh, 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 C 0, C s and A s for a spherical model right and so on right. So, we have we have these different uh, you know starting points. So, as an analyst we should perhaps do it more than one variogram model to see which one is providing me a more sensible uh, you know interpretation. Okay, so, the least squares least squares algorithm is as follows. We are trying to first of all we take a difference between 2 gamma h j that is the true value which is the observed value the data minus the model mathematical model form which is either it could be linear or spherical or whatever. I take this difference for every h. Okay? Now, obviously, if I know the value of h, the value 2 gamma h j theta will simply be a function of theta. right? So, I can take this and, and take a square of it. So, it is a squared difference. So, the farther away you are from the given observed data, I am going to penalize you by a square. This square difference is minimized because I want a least squares. right? So, I am squaring and then I want a least squares and that gives me a least squares algorithm. For known h values, the only variable in this entire formulation is theta. So, the, so my choice variable when I am minimizing is going to be theta. right? So, this exercise will give me, right? so this will provide theta hat least squares that is going to be let us say C o uh, hat least squares and b hat least squares. Now, remember C o, C o hat least squares or b hat least squares are alternative estimates for the same model parameters nugget effect and the rate of decline in uh, spatial dependence through a different algorithm called the least squares algorithm. Earlier, we evaluated C o hat uh, or C 0 hat m l and b hat m l. We just have alternative estimates of the same here. Okay? Now, I'm, I must specify that this is for a linear variogram. Okay? Now, uh, 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 the difference, so the least squares algorithm has a few properties. So, we are just going to call them nodes. The first point is that the least squares algorithm provides a direct estimation of uh, you know uh, of a variogram based on spatial dependence right now this is different so i can say as opposed to uh, to the indirect ml estimation process procedure why was ml indirect because ml was first you know using the variance covariance structure. So, it goes indirectly towards the variogram estimation. right? So, indirect because it is through you know the variance covariance matrix sigma theta. right? Uh, but that does not make maximum likelihood you know less legitimate in any way. It is it is also going to be slightly biased, but still maximum likelihood is very tractable and it is uh, you know also allows for very different uh, you know it is it is much more general than uh, than than least square something that you know uh, you will realize as you uh, work practically with with data. The second point with least squares is that you know you can incorporate multiple directions 
uh, uh, can be incorporated by adding uh, the respected respective squared differences. Okay? So, if you add, you know, if you go back to this formulation, you know, I mean, you basically are saying that I, you just need to sort of add all the different squares, right? So, here I have I've sort of uh, done a short typo, I should add the, the least the squares, right? So, I have squared the differences, but I should have added them from j equals 1 to k. So, if I add, you know, these more, you know, uh, squared differences for let us say direction e tilde, I could simply just add them here and, 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 and minimize the whole sum together for two different directions or three different directions and so on and so forth. So, incorporating different directions is not so problematic or not so complicated with uh, the direct estimation process of least squares as opposed to it, it to what it would have been uh, 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 for the indirect, uh, you know, uh, maximum likelihood procedure. Okay. The last topic that I want to touch upon uh, in today's lecture uh, uh, is called as the generalized, the generalized uh, uh, least square squares algorithm. So, this sort of you know uh, uh, is sort of motivated by the fact that you know we have a uh, you know a, 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 a sequence just like we have a sequence of data z1 to zn, right. And for these sequence of data we can write the mean and we can write the variance. Similar to that you know we have a sequence of, 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 of these uh, you know uh, variogram values. So, we have this 2 gamma at h 1. 2 gamma at h 2 and till 2 gamma till h you know some k value, right. So, we really have a vector of let us say k by 1 values of 2 gamma just like remember we had this vector for z as well this was a n by 1 vector z 1, z 2, z n this. For this vector, vector of data right we could write a mean value z bar and we could also write a variance of z bar right we can, we can we can simply calculate these things given the data set that we have similar to that you know there is going to be a variance of this 2 gamma value okay i mean this 2 gamma is nothing but a vector so i can just define it as slightly differently here so, I should be able to now figure out a variance covariance structure of this, you know, value. Now, k by 1, if I have a vector which is k by 1 size, the variance covariance vector will be a k by k. So, I am really looking at variance of 2 gamma h 1, variance of 2 gamma h 2, so variance of 2 gamma h k, but then also covariance between the experimental plot at location 1 and location 2. So, not only the data will exhibit, you know, uh, 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 spatial dependence, but in some way even the, 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 the variogram will exhibit that. Because you will have, you know, covariance with lag h1 and covariance with lag h2 and so on and so forth. So, if you have such a structure where there is a variance covariance matrix such that you do not have you know the off diagonal elements being 0 or all the diagonal elements being equal to each other, then the least squares estimates are inconsistent. And what you really need is a GLS algorithm, right, which looks like the following. So, just like you know in case of OLS, we are going to minimize with choice variable theta, but now my you know uh, 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 my formulation of what I am minimizing is going to be different. So, I am going to define this V as the variance covariance matrix or I could say it is omega let us say uh, 
okay i have omega and omega inverse 2 gamma minus 2 gamma theta so i have a slightly more complicated you know function to minimize what you will realize is if you look at the the size of this you will see that it is also a scalar one by one let's do that right 2 gamma by itself is a k by 1 2 gamma theta is going to be k by 1 the whole thing transpose is going to be 1 by k sigma inverse is k by k and this is just k by 1 the first two together is 1 by k and the that then multiplied to the last matrix is going to be give me 1 by 1 so i am really minimizing a scalar value with respect to theta i will write my first order conditions but this will yield theta hat gls and not just ls it's a generalized least squared estimate right it is more robust and it's it's a consistent estimator uh, 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 so so and and you know if you if you are interested in more information about this you can go back and read it from cressy's book as far as getting to these values you know uh, you you have all of this you are going to have all of this canned in software and we will do this in you know you can you can study this when you uh, are are are, are uh, you know uh, 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 looking at the software uh, you know hands on tutorial but the point of the matter is that if you had a more complicated variance structure of the of 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 the variogram the experimental variogram which is going to be likely right if the data themselves are you know spatially dependent in the second moment then the variogram is nothing but the representation of a second moment for an intrinsically stationary uh, uh, data so that means that the second moment of this uh, you know variogram representation is likely to be uh, more complicated than what the least squares would uh, you know assume that is the diagonal elements are the same and off diagonal elements are zero that's the least square assumption which may not be realistic what may be realistic is what we have seen on uh, uh, you know uh, the slide in front of you you must go over today's lecture one more time uh, they are a little bit more involved and you must read cressy's book it's this this material is in chapter 2 and you must read it from the book as well okay so thank you very much for your attention uh, we will uh, going forward we will study uh, you know we will look at variogram estimation uh, uh, in, in, in situations which are a little bit more interesting such that you know the spatial domain may be non-stationary or it might exhibit long term trends which does not let these uh, spatial domains to be stationary. Uh, they require a little bit more uh, uh, than what if we were to simply assume stationary domains and you know in real world we may not always come across stationary domains. So we will go ahead and study that in the next lecture and through that we will then introduce spatial prediction and study what is called as spatial kriging okay so thank you very much for your attention and see you in the next lecture mm -hmm.